Hello and welcome back to Analysis Review. The bunting is out, the flags unfurled. The United Kingdom is all braced for the Diamond Jubilee. Queen Elizabeth took to the throne at a time when wartime austerity was still ever present. Sixty years on, she reigns over a country that is more prosperous, more diverse, but also arguably more divided and in the grip of austerity. As Britain prepares for a national celebration, is the real story that of a disuniting kingdom? With me here to discuss this are Brian Groom, the FT's UK Affairs Specialist, and Robert Shrimsley, one of our columnists and managing editor of FT.com. Welcome to you both. Brian, I want to start with you. You've done analysis for us, looking sort of back to then, 1952 and now. What struck you most about the changes that have taken place to this country since then? Well, I, I certainly think it's a looser society than it was then. In 52, Britain was just coming out of um, the Second World War and a, and a period of austerity, which was quite a, a unifying event. And it was a more, there were big class divisions, but broadly it was a more ordered, deferential, conservative society. Since then, we, 60 years, we've had globalization, mass immigration, European integration, devolution, huge changes and a massive increase in, in personal income, and which has left people freer, but, but, but in many ways more unequal. And the word I, the word I, I like from this is, is that the, the historian David Kiniston shows the word a more dispersed society, both geographically, where you've got Scotland kind of voting on independence in a couple of years, and on a personal level, when uh, it's a more kind of privatized society, people are freer to do things, and we have more com fewer communal activities. Robert, bring you in, I mean, when you think of that, period that we've chose to frame because of the Jubilee, what, what strikes you most of, of how the country has changed? Well, I think I mean, Brian's talked about a lot of the economic trends. One of the things he touched on, which I'm very struck by, is the way we're a more atomized society socially as well. If one takes one perhaps relevant example, uh, in 1987, something like 28 million people watched the Queen's message at Christmas. Last year, six million or so watched the Queen's message. And it's striking that there's very, there are far fewer things that tie us together communally. If one sticks, for example, with the idea of television, one of the reasons, obviously, in 1987 was there were far fewer channels to watch, far fewer things to do. There are far fewer events that tie us together as a nation, be it a cup final or you know, the, the, the final on TV of the X Factor. There are far fewer things that we all do at the same time and watch together. So we're just a much more diverse society. Do you think this jubilee will count as one of these national, I mean, genuinely national events? I mean, you've mentioned... You yeah, know, well, I mean, clearly it will, because we're all aware of it. Many, many people are participating. The number of street parties, I can't remember the figure, but it's up substantially. Lots of people are very up for participating in it. I think one thing that's quite important be that we shouldn't necessarily assume that means that we've become a much more monarchist nation again. And I also think it would be a mistake to confuse affection and respect for the Queen which is very deep running, clearly, um, with affection and respect for the monarchy as an institution in itself. I think it would do the royal family no good to make that mistake. Yeah, OK. I just want to come back to one point you mentioned earlier, Brian, you, you referred to, just go a bit deeper into that, um, Scotland. Uh, you said part of that, the dispersed uh, kingdom. I mean, that arguably is the issue that poses the greatest threat to the integrity of the UK, isn't it? I mean, do you see that? I mean, is that part of a more broader trend or is it just a very Scottish thing? It's probably, it's probably the most striking change on a constitutional level since then. In the 1950s Scotland voted Conservative. Probably the Tories got more than half the vote in 1955. Now it's dominated by the Scottish National Party. Uh, the polls suggest that, that, um, that there isn't going to be a vote for independence. It rarely rises much above 33%. Uh, but even if it did, I'm not sure it would have it would have repercussions elsewhere. But there aren't other parts of the UK waiting to go out the door. Support for independence in Wales is very very low. Uh, in Northern Ireland, you're, you're in a generation you may have the Catholic minority becoming a majority. But polls suggest that even then, a lot of Catholics now would rather stick with the UK than go for United Ireland. Yeah. And Robert, I mean, just we've seen this government uh, has tried to disperse authority away from London, they've talked up things like localism, they've tried to get local mayors, but it doesn't seem to really be working, which would speak a bit against uh, the, the suggestion that things have been dispersed. Well, it? given the chance to vote for more politicians, the public isn't doing so. <laughs> given the chance to vote for more mayors, more electives, more electives, that they show no great desire. The, the, the settled attitude of the British public is that it really doesn't like being bothered and intruded upon by politicians. We accept that, you know, it's our duty to vote every year, every, every five years or whatever, but then we really want our politicians to get on with it. Do you think, against the backdrop, though, of some of the things Brian's referred to, that, you know, apart from events like the Jubilee, and you've talked about that a bit, that 
Britons are more or less proud to be British. I mean, are we seeing, people have talked a lot in recent mm -hmm. years, the Scottish have become more Scottish, the English have become more English. Well, I think you've actually touched upon a key point, that when we talk about people being proud to be British, I think that's a very English phenomenon. I think the English are proud to be British and also proud to be English. Um, and I think it's all th for a lot of people, those two, English and British have become synonymous. Clearly, one of the things that's driving the independence movement in Scotland is a feeling that Britain is England, really, and that they want to assert their own identity. Do you share that, Brian? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you, you, we shouldn't overestimate the, the sort of centrifugal forces here. In, in many ways, identity is evolving to, to, to the situation. Yes, people, uh, polls now suggest that people think of themselves as Scottish or Welsh or English before British. But if you ask them, are you proud to be British, for instance, in the British Social Attitudes Survey, 81% still think they're very or somewhat proud to be British. So it's changing, but it's not falling apart. And one also should say, I mean, the extraordinary jingoism and patriotism you see, even in trivial things like fo football matches, it's still very, very deeply rooted. The British forces, the British football team. I, I, I there, think is no British, there is no British football team. There is no British. I'm sorry, we're about to head into the Olympics. I think you'll find that there is a British football team in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> well known. It may do better than the national yeah. ones. <laughs> Just wanted to talk about looking a bit at the Jubilee, and you referred to the the street parties and all of that. I mean, obviously, the the, the coronation took uh, took place at a time when there was still a lot of real post-war. Uh, hardship, austerity, and I mean people always say it brought a lot of sparkle and cheer to a nation um, that, that, that was in desperate need of it. I'm not. I mean, one wouldn't want to compare those times exactly with the times now, but we are, as we've said, going through a period of austerity. Do you think it's the job of a monarchy to bring a bit of cheer and lift the spirits? Is that the role that they...? <laughs> well, certainly they, uh, they're kind of figurehead to the nation, and I think this weekend probably will bring a fair amount of cheer around. But as Robert says, they, you, you, uh, a lot of that is, is to do with the, the personal standing of the Queen. Um, there is residual support for the monarchy as an institution. That didn't really waver m that much, even in the dark days of the 1990s, because uh, people aren't really uh, much taken by the alternative. But I don't think the, uh, the, the royal family can't you know, rest on their laurels here. It's, um, it, it I, actually, I strongly disagree with the idea that it's the job of the Queen to cheer us up. I mean, leaving aside the idea of what we'd be like if we were cheered up by octogenarians all the time. Um, <laughs> actually, I think one of the reasons for the revival of the and revival might be too strong. But one of the reasons why the, the, the royal family seems more popular now is actually it's become a lot more boring. It was a bit too interesting mm -hmm. um, a while back when it was filling up the front pages of newspapers with the soap opera and the sagas and the broken marriages. One of the things that you notice about the royal family at the moment is they're not very interesting. They're not doing things that are making. Are they the still page. relevant though? I mean, you you've referred to that. You know, it, it, they are one of the few genuine national institutions. Mm -hmm. in it. Are they relevant? Well, I don't know. I mean, how relevant is the royal family in people's everyday lives? Well, not very relevant at all. I think a lot of people find them reassuring. And that goes back to my point about being boring. The more they are steady, reassuring, exactly what you expect them to be, um, the greater the longevity of the institution. The more they try to be interesting, have strong views on politics, as we suggest Prince mm. Charles might do, um, the more problematic it's going to be. Okay, final question, Brian. Robert mentioned Prince Charles because the polls, I think you referenced it in your research, suggest lots of support for the Queen, less for Prince Charles. Do you see trouble ahead for the House of Windsor? Well, it's going to be very interesting, certainly. The, the poll, some polls suggest that the, that the public like um, the monarchy, but they would prefer to go straight to Prince William as the next monarch rather than um, Prince Charles, and that's not how the deal works no. with that's monarchy. That, that's not <laughs> in the script, just, no. It's <laughs> not, <laughs> it's not um, unless he voluntarily decides that to happen, that's not what will happen. And um, Charles is a man with uh, with more kind of more overt views on many topics than than his mother had. So it's going to be a fascinating time, mm -hmm. indeed. Well, we'll wait for that one. Brian Groom, Robert Shrimsey, thank you both very much, and thank you for watching. To read Brian's analysis of a disuniting kingdom and more pieces from our analysis pages, go to ft.com/analysis. Thank you for watching, and until the next time, goodbye.